Uh, I'd like to begin in the usual way by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, the lands of, lands of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, and by paying our respects to their elders past and present. This evening we gather to honour the life and work of the late Dr John G. A.O., a distinguished figure in the field of arms control and disarmament. And I'd like to begin by doing what's one of, generally one of my, my favourite things to do each, each year, it's really a highlight of the year, um, to welcome John G.'s family here um, this evening, his wife um, Liv, lo lovely to see you again Liv, um, our daughter Chrissy, um, an old, old friend and um, former colleague and, uh, and Nicholas, um, his son. It's wonderful to have you here with us um, this evening to celebrate um, John's remarkable achievements. And I'd also very much uh, like to um, thank and acknowledge um, Bob Matthews and, and Rob Barton, um, who initiated this lecture series and who are also present here with us this evening. Um, I'd like to extend a very special thanks to the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and, and Trade for their partnership with the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre in delivering the 2024G lecture. Their support um, has been um, invaluable and, and is greatly appreciated. We're honoured to have with us here this evening Dr Robert Floyd, the Executive Secretary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organisation. Dr Floyd began his tenure as Executive Secretary in August 2021, becoming only the fourth person to hold this esteemed position. Prior to this role, Dr Floyd served as Director General of the Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office, or ANSA, uh, ASNO, um, from 2010 to 2021. His distinguished career has also included several senior positions uh, with the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. The title of uh, this year's John G. Memorial Lecture is Testing Times, Bold Choices, Successes, Lessons and Challenges on the Road to a World Without Nuclear Testing. We are privileged to have Dr Floyd with us here tonight to share his thoughts and insights on this critical global issue. So without further ado, um, it's my great pleasure not only to welcome Dr Floyd home, um, here to Australia, but also to welcome him to the podium. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to him. Thank you so much, Brendan. I still call Australia home, right? <laughs> it's uh, really a great honour and a privilege to be here to deliver a lecture in honour of John G. Um, somebody who I never met, um, but from what I have learned, I only wish I had. But somebody who has modelled, I think, the very best of Australian diplomacy, and particularly in the area of weapons of mass destruction control. So to the family members, um, I'm sure you are rightfully very proud of John and his contribution, but on behalf of others from Australia, our thanks and the friends. Um, Bob, where's Rod? Oh, over this side, right. <laughs> yeah, you guys uh, certainly are driving forces to see John remembered and, uh, and honoured in this way, so a great job you know, for you as well. So, <laughs> Professor Taylor, the family and friends of John G, ladies and gentlemen, it certainly is my deep appreciation to have this opportunity to deliver this lecture in honour, as I've said, of a giant of Australian diplomacy in pursuit of a better world, a world free of weapons of mass destruction. Testing times, bold choices. Let's start with testing times. Then we'll talk about the trials and tribulations and the opportunities of multilateralism. And finally, those bold choices. So the Oppenheimer movie does its best. But it's hard to grasp now how our world changes on the 16th of July, 1945, in New Mexico. The first nuclear weapon test features a metal, metal casing festooned with cables, roughly the size of a, a home swimming pool. And they called it affectionately the gadget. It's heavy 
and it's hauled to the top of a steel tower. Legendary nuclear scientist Enrico Fermi is watching. Nervous anticipation, excitement tinged with a little fear. Will the very atmosphere ignite? And if so, will it destroy just New Mexico or the whole planet? The gadget explodes. Nothing like this has been seen in Earth in 4.5 billion years of history. We ingenious humans have set free the energy trapped in the smallest amount of matter, creating a vast explosion. 21 days later, the world's first atomic bomb falls on Hiroshima. Maybe some of you have visited Hiroshima. Last year, I took part in the annual commemoration of the bombing in Hiroshima. And in the Hiroshima Peace Museum, I saw this tiny tricycle belonging to a three-year-old, Sunichi Tetsanu. He'd been happily playing on his bike outside that fateful morning, killed along with his two sisters. But well over a kilometer away from where the bomb was dropped. First, atomic bombs, then, thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs. As the Oppenheimer movie describes, the big questions are there right from the start. Other states will acquire these staggering new weapons, then what? How to control all this? Who decides how to stop cheating? More and more tests, bigger and bigger tests, in the air, in the sea, on the land. Twelve tests here in Australia. Radioactivity spreads, public concern rises, traces from the tests are detectable today in our Great Barrier Reef in the deep mid-ocean trenches, in elephant tusks in Africa, in the trees of Latin America. Diplomatic wrangling continues. A central issue is verification, how to set up a reliable global detection that can prevent secret tests. In 1963, the USA the USSR and the UK signed the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. That treaty is clear. It prohibits nuclear explosions in the sea, the atmosphere and outer space. Those tests are actually easy to detect. And it's ambitious for what should follow. It's ambitious for a speedy agreement on complete disarmament under strict international control and a comprehensive test ban. No more underground tests either. That's its ambition. But a total ban of tests has to wait. In 1968 comes the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and its preamble talks of seeking to achieve a discontinuance of all test explosions of nuclear weapons for all time and to continue negotiations to that end, end of quote. But nothing to make that a reality. The wait continues. By the time the NPT is agreed, there's been nearly 900 nuclear weapon tests. Underground nuclear weapon tests continue at a dizzy rate, roughly one test every week from 1968 until the Cold War ended. The Cold War ends. A diplomatic window of opportunity opens. The long wait finally ends. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or CTBT, is agreed in 1996. One year later, Brendan um, started his studies in this 
department and area, and he is still here today. So almost as long as the CTBT, but uh, 1997, Brendan, right? <laughs> okay, one year before you, the CTBT was opened for signature in 1996. Those states who signed the treaty established a new international organisation to preside over the development of the crucial verification regime underpinning that treaty. That's the CTBTO, the organisation that I lead today. Those five decades from 1945 to 1996 were testing times. Nuclear weapons testing times. Before the CTBT was signed, there'd been more than 2,000 nuclear weapon tests, many far bigger than the bomb that devastated Hiroshima. After the CTBT is signed, in the nearly three decades from 24th of September 1996, when the CTBT was open for signature, through to today, the 9th of October 2024, fewer than one dozen test events. That's all, friends. In this century, the current century, only one state has tested a nuclear weapon, North Korea. By the standards of the past 80 years, we're no longer in the nuclear weapon testing times. Testing has almost stopped. The CTBT has been a dramatic success. With each day without a test, the global norm against these tests becomes that much more credible. Nuclear weapon testing now is seen as outrageous and seen as menacing. Something shameful, morally repugnant, an insult to the environment and to humanity. And that norm weighs on all states. Those that have signed the CTBT and the now very small number that have not. Here I pay tribute to John G. He represented Australia as a leader in another long struggle in the arms control area, ridding the world of chemical weapons. He contrib his contribution was immense and at a critical time. The result of the work of John and his colleagues, chemical weapon stocks are now almost eliminated. Chemical weapons attacks are few and far between. And they too are seen as shameful and morally repugnant. The CTBTO and the OPCW are about verification using science and technology to build confidence and provide assurance. In fact, the CTBT was finally agreed because the hard diplomacy and the hard science came together. By 1996, it was clear that any explosion, including underground test explosions, could be detected using a range of technologies. Under the CTBT, the International Monitoring System, or IMS, was set up. And it's a wonder of today's scientific world. We have 306 facilities around the planet, including remote stations in extreme environments, isolated islands, deserts, Arctic tundra. The CTBTO stations, they gather seismic data, picking up vibrations in the Earth's crust. Hydroacoustic data, vibrations and sounds in the ocean. Infrasound data, vibrations in the atmosphere. And radionuclide data, radioactive particles and gases in the atmosphere. Australia hosts 21 of those 306 facilities. The third most of any state in the network. From Antarctica to Alice Springs, Melbourne to Cocos Island. All CTBTO technologies are represented in Australia, a powerful, diverse and complex segment of our international monitoring system. Friends, our planet, it's a noisy place. Earthquakes, landslides, 
asteroid strikes, explosions in conflict, mining blasts, whale sounds bouncing around the oceans. There's plenty going on out there. But our system, it detects it all. It gathers a tremendous amount of valuable data and it has been put to a vast array of different uses. But just say an explosion happens this very evening, a large and unusual one. Our IMS network detects it in seconds. Something significant has happened. The IMS stations detect the vibrations and send the data via satellite into Vienna. Our computers compare these signals with all the planet's usual background noise. Alarm bells start ringing. Within a couple of hours, if the technical profile is of an event which matches a nuclear test, the alarms are ringing. Where exactly was that test? We'll have a pretty good idea, down to maybe within a couple of kilometres, depending where on Earth the explosion happened. Testing in secret? Impossible. Then the diplomacy starts. To play on the old quote about democracy, multilateralism is like a raft. You never sink, but your feet are always in the water. The benefits of multilateralism are everywhere. The internet protocols that we use to chat around the world for free, thank God for that, for the grandchildren who are in Australia. Shipping routes, air safety, food exports, import controls, climate targets, managing cross-border health threats, and of course, arms control and international security. Let me give you some examples of how multilateral principles have affected the CTBTO in practice. Firstly, multilateralism is slow. The more states in the negotiations or in the organisation, the slower it gets. I see Josie over here nodding. She has just come back from five years at the OPCW. She knows all about that. But the more states in the negotiation or the organisation, the slower it gets. Each state raises its own concerns. And as we've seen in arms control, negotiations drag on. Not for years, but for decades. It can also be slow for another reason, money. So governments tend to fret quite a lot about money and seeing it well spent. So how does the CTBTO's own financing work? Each state signatory has an assessed contribution, paid annually. There's a formula for the assessment, larger, rich countries, they pay more. We can run all of our monitoring stations only if we receive the assessed contributions. And the CTBTO does well here. Most states pay on time and in full. Everyone knows that the IMS network is magnificent, but it costs a lot to maintain its high performance. So much for money. Another feature of multilateralism is precision. States take great care when making legally binding agreements. We've agreed to this and only this. I've mentioned the background noise that our IMS system picks up as it looks for possible nuclear tests. When you're looking for a sharp needle in a gigantic haystack, you get good at scrutinising a lot of hay. Every day we take in 36 gigabytes of data. For those of you that stream videos, you might think that's small, but if it's just numbers, that is a huge amount of data. So for you, Mrs G, it's a huge amount of data. I know you're a streamer. You know. And for the past seven years, none 
that that data has indicated a nuclear test. And that is good. But isn't all the data really useful for other things like studying earthquakes, tracking environmental changes, following whales? Yes, it is. And that's what states and researchers do with the data. I've already mentioned whales. Our data helped discover an entirely new subspecies of pygmy blue whale in the Indian Ocean. They even made a film about it. CTBTO data has also helped in response to some tragedies. Finding the Argentinian submarine San Juan, which tragically imploded in 2017 deep in the South Atlantic Ocean. Two of our remote hydroacoustic stations thousands of kilometres away in Accension Island and Crozet Islands detected the implosion. The submarine was found within 20 kilometres of the pin drop that my colleagues provided to the Argentinians. Thousands of kilometres away, those stations. Most significantly, our data is a powerful global resource for disaster warning. While our focus is detecting tests, we also provide data for tsunami warning centres all around the world. This helps governments and people to be ready to respond to the threat of disasters as quickly as they can. Another related big multilateralism point. The data we collect does not belong to the CTBTO. It is freely available to all of our 187 state signatories equally. You need some serious technical capacity, though, and scientific skill to take in these non-stop data stream and to analyse it properly. We want those capabilities to be present in all of our state signatories. That is why our National Data Centres for All initiative is a high priority to us. It helps small states build the serious scientific capability that they need to take in our data and to use it for various civil and scientific purposes. I've got to say, enthusiastic uptake by small states. This strengthens the case for this treaty. Really, it is for all states, not just for the wealthier states, the more capable states, but for all states. Yes, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is for all states. Its verification system is credible and respected. It works. It's fair. This success is all the more impressive as the treaty hasn't yet entered into force. Why? Because under the treaty's Annex 2, 44 specific named states have to ratify the treaty for it to enter into force. Nine still need to do so. Momentum towards universality, though, is increasing. States are still signing and ratifying. In fact, nine ratifying in the past 30 months. The CTBTO now has 187 signatories out of a possible 196. 178 ratifications. It's a mighty convergence of view. Still, without entry into force, we don't have the treaty's full set of verification tools. No consultation and clarification procedures. No confidence building measures. And friends, above all, no on-site inspection, or OSI as we call it. Why does that matter? Well, imagine the scenario we were talking about earlier, this very evening. Our system detects what looks like a nuclear explosion. We can determine in which state it happened. And we're close to certain that the explosion was a nuclear test. We alert our state signatories accordingly. However, the state concerned flatly denies that the explosion was a nuclear test. Then what? Then what? Tension grows, recriminations fly, new uncertainty for international security. If the treaty were in force, we'd have the option of on-site inspection. A team of CTBTO trained and international inspectors 
would then have the legal mandate to travel to the suspected explosion site with over 100 tonnes of equipment, serious excess baggage charges. The CTBTO could advise the world with certainty. Yes, a nuclear explosion has taken place at that site, or no, nothing illicit under the treaty has happened at that site. In short, without entry into force, the treaty can't do all that it was intended to do. I talk of the success of the international monitoring system and it stands as it will detect a nuclear explosion anywhere. But that is not enough. We need the full range of verification capabilities. We continue to work on the on-site inspection capability. We've just completed a major field exercise in Hungary. Part of our preparation for a full exercise in Sri Lanka next year. And that is going to test our people, our procedures, our equipment. When entry into force happens, we're going to be ready. Testing times, bold choices. That early era of nuclear testing was appalling, was unacceptable. The current period, with only a handful of tests this century, is a vast political and moral improvement. However, if a significant nuclear weapons state, possessor state, was to return to nuclear testing, the CTBT would be at risk. Even the global nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament regime would be at risk. A far wider and reckless nuclear arms race could ensure. Would we all have the restraint or the good luck to avoid a nuclear war. That's the nightmare scenario, friends. Another possibility is we could chug along as we are with the CTBT. The CTBT remains not in force, but few, if any, nuclear tests actually happen as a result of the powerful global norm against testing. By far the best option is that the nations of the world unite and make a bold choice. To agree that nuclear weapons testing stops once and for all, and the CTBT enters into force, a bold choice. In the first John G. Memorial Lecture, Gareth Evans quoted a Russian diplomat, Mikhail Bedenikov, talking in 2007 of John's contribution. And I quote, today almost one third of the world's chemical weapons and two thirds of its production capacity has been destroyed. Much of the credit, according to Mikhail Bedenikov, much of the credit for these truly historic accomplishments, without exaggeration, goes to John G. Few can claim such a legacy. Few indeed. But how to emulate such a success? How to set in motion the verifiable end of all of the thousands of nuclear weapons that still are in existence today? That's our challenge. Such a world requires a powerful and verifiable ban on nuclear testing, the CTBT. War in Ukraine, dangerous tensions across the Middle East, unease in your own Indo-Pacific region, as so-called strategic competition intensifies. There's media reporting of heightened activity at former nuclear test sites, discussions, even threats of the possible use of nuclear weapons are back, like we hoped they would never be. So when you're as close to all that as I am, you feel both pessimistic and more optimistic. What are the current prospects then of those bold choices? Not good in the short term, let me be honest. Not good in the short term without a disaster. But do we give up? Absolutely no way. 
In the 2007 lecture, Gareth Evans also said, John G communicated his arguments in a quiet and persistent way. He impressed with his command of the issues and his integrity, and in a way which was enormously effective in getting results, end of quote. There's no better way to sum up how to make progress in multilateralism and how smart Australian diplomacy makes its own special contribution. In global diplomacy, Australians are seen as honest and direct. Our what you see is what you get or our no messing around type approach is powerful and attractive. And I see some in the audience smiling as they recognise these traits. But that's not enough. Here's what I've learned. Today's multilateralism requires formidable patience. Patience? and maybe with some guile, in pursuing suggestions. Patience in building relationships that help you do that. Careful, respectful listening. Bringing in other voices while somehow keeping the whole process focused on the goal and edging forward towards it. Australians bring something powerful to these debates. There's a fascinating book by Rebecca Johnson, Unfinished Business, The Negotiation of the CTBT and the End of Nuclear Testing. The book drills deep into the negotiating history of the CTBT. It describes how Australian diplomats were right there at the heart of the negotiations, lobbying and drafting, suggesting and proposing, persuading and pushing. Australians help, helped get this remarkable treaty agreed. And they were right there and we're still right there today, pushing tenaciously to implement it, to protect it and to see it enter into force. The CTBT is at the heart of global security. We need it now and we will continue to need it off into the future. Even if we think of a time when there were no more nuclear weapons. We'll still need the international monitoring system to guarantee that anyone breaking the rules is immediately found out. We Australians have had nuclear weapons tests in our own territory. Now, we help the world make the right, bold choices. Never again here, never again anywhere else. Thank you.